Good evening. My name is Andrew Cohen, and I'm the director of the Jean Beer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics. Thank you for joining us this evening. Several programs at Georgia State University were given the opportunity to foster conversation about a timely issue in ethics and public policy. We chose the topic of immigration, because immigration touches on crucial themes, including the proper extent of state power, who we are as a political community, and what a proper response is to poverty and oppression abroad, and many other themes. Immigration policies, as we know, have recently become increasingly controversial among and within industrialized countries. There are many economic concerns, such as about the impact immigrants may have on jobs and social welfare resources, access to crucial opportunities for community building, and education are other key issues. And immigration policies also impact the freedoms of migrants and the persons who might wish to host or hire them. And as we know, there are deep-seated disagreements about issues of group identity. Immigration debates often revolve around what shape a national culture has and how it might and should evolve. Many writers also worry about the impact of immigration policies on home countries and, of course, on prospective immigrants themselves. This is why immigration policy has important moral and economic dimensions. We hope that today's symposium will constructively further conversation on this topic. We bring together several distinguished scholars to touch on some key themes that arise in many discussions about immigration. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to offer a note of thanks. We're very grateful to the estate of Professor C. Richard Long for making this and many other events possible. Richard was quite kind to support events that inspired interdisciplinary conversation about issues of interest to scholars in philosophy, scholars in economics, as well as participants in public debate. Immigration touches on themes of central importance to philosophy and economics. And so we're happy to dedicate this evening's conversation to his memory. Professor Paul Stefan of Georgia State's Department of Economics has some further remarks about Professor Long. Thanks very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to make a few remarks about our late colleague, Richard Long. I first met Richard when I joined the faculty of the Department of Economics in the fall of 1971. There was an immediate connection between the two of us, given that Richard and I grew up in the northwest corner of the state of Arkansas. Richard on the Fort Smith side of what people in Arkansas refer to as Mount Gaylord, and I grew up on the Fayetteville side of Mount Gaylord. Richard had joined the Department of Economics three years earlier, after first working at the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank. And he came to the Fed in the fall of 1965 after he got his PhD in macroeconomics from Vanderbilt University. When I think of Richard, I think of someone characterized by an experience, by an exceptional breadth of interest and of talent. Like all faculty, Richard taught courses and did research but Richard also had found time to get a master's degree in philosophy while he was on the faculty. And it's that connection that has brought the Department of Economics and Philosophy together for events such as this. Richard was very active in campus politics and served three years as president of the local chapter of the American Association of University Professors. And during the late 1960s, Richard did volunteer work with civil rights groups and with groups promoting integrated housing in Atlanta. In his leisure time, Richard played tournament chess, and he was very, very good. He held city championship titles in Dallas when he was at SMU, Nashville, and Atlanta, and state championship titles in Arkansas, Tennessee, and Iowa. He twice played, and as he reported, lost to Bobby Fischer. <coughs> And you can find the moves of one of these games if you Google Richard's name with Bobby Fisher on the web 
And I think it's very, very interesting. The move by move is there, and it happened almost exactly 50 years ago to this day. Uh, and for those of you who are too young to know who Bobby Fisher is, <laughs> and it looks like there's some of you in this group, um, Bobby Fisher held the World um, Chess Championship between 1972 and 1975. Richard was a very serious cyclist and bike with various family members, one of whom, daughter Ruth, is right there in the second row. And with family members, he biked um, all over England, France, and Holland, as well as in Iowa and in Georgia. And I don't think any of us will ever forget Richard's description of the time in the fall of 1974 that while riding his bike with friends, he was sideswiped by a trailer that was pulling the boat, and this trailer had a pole on it somehow that got caught in his bike, and suddenly Richard is going at 50 miles an hour being pulled by this and passing everybody else on their bikes, okay? Well, I won't keep you in as much suspense. What happened is that Richard quickly realized that the only means of escape was to climb up his bike and jump in the boat, which he did, and he started waving frantically, and eventually the truck driver saw him in his rear view mirror and stopped. And with that, I'll stop. <laughs> evening will be as follows. So we're first going to hear from our featured speakers, each for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then our four panelist discussants will offer some impromptu remarks about the presentations. And all of these remarks we expect will foster continuing conversation, including among us this evening, and we'll have a chance for an open Q&A. Our first speaker is Professor Richard B. Freeman, who joins us from the Economics Department at Harvard University. Professor Freeman is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He received the Minzer Lifetime Achievement Prize from the Society of Labor Economics in 2006. In 2007, he was awarded the IZA Prize in Labor Economics. You can read a little bit more about him and his work in the brochure for this evening. His presentation this evening is titled, One World in What Matters? International Students, Immigration, and the spread of knowledge. I'm going to give you some uh, information and uh, some ideas. Hopefully, oh, oh, there's a problem. Oh my God. What should I say? Should I say you're prepared? I think I'll do that. Let's see what happens. PowerPoint. It removes the unreadable content. We'll see if there's anything left. <laughs> All these wonderful equations that I worked on this past weekend that I knew you wanted. Okay, so there's the there's the title. And uh, oops, here we, here's down here. there we go. Okay, this is what I wanted to, 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 to talk about. I, I think I think there's a good case to be made that the the, 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 the whole issue of globalization immigration has ultimately to do with knowledge because it is the transformation and, and uh, spread of knowledge around the world that is the heart of our modern civilization. And we'll see where immigration uh, fits into this. So that's what this says. And uh, it turns out, I'll give you some evidence, that international students, of whom I assume there are a fair number in this audience, um, then we had high-level immigrants who, it turns out, are disproportionately made up of international students. Uh, they're actually critical to what the U.S. does in, 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 the, in the world. So like I said here, the U.S. cannot retreat to a knowledge autarky uh, without suffering huge losses through our position uh, as a, uh, as basically the leader of the global chain of knowledge. That's my opinion. What I'm going to do is give you four bits of information. Um, and then I just, here I just put down most of these uh, things. They're, they're actually our papers. You can download it from the internet if you want. 
Most of them are National Bureau of Economic Research working papers. Some are forthcoming uh, uh, things. So this is the this is the basis of more material, if you wish. So the one ring that rules them all comes from where, where did I get that from? Yeah, it's Frodo's fight, fighting with the uh, Gimli or creature for the, for the one week that rules, 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 the world. Well, if you start thinking about what it is that affects every economy and every society, it, it's knowledge, and knowledge has become global. So I said, it moves developing countries. You're a poor country, and at one stage you use the old-fashioned technologies. Well, nowadays, I need mean, some more evidence in a bit, you use modern technologies. That creates a problem for America because we have higher wages than the poor country. If we're both using the same technology, obviously the lower cost uh, production will, 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 will win. It also allows for this immigration of high-skilled people uh, because people around the world nowadays know English and they can come to, the, uh, to, to our country and they also from their, their university education, they basically will be learning not every field, but in most fields, the exact same things we learn. Um, you, you know, you're, you're, your math is going to be the same math around the world. If it's physics, it's the same physics. Um, and that means that people in other countries suddenly can have the same skills we have, and therefore can come. Um, and if you believe, and I think most economists do, that knowledge is the key thing in productivity and growth, um, it's spread and creation is indeed the one ring, uh, ring that rules them all. It's not trade, it's not capital flows, it's knowledge that's the most important thing that, that's going around the world. So now let me tell you a little bit about spread of knowledge. This exhibit is showing you the uh, university the, uh, it's enrollments in universities around the world. Just look at the U.S. Uh, figure. In 1970, 29% of university students around the world were enrolled in the United States. That's the earliest year we have uh, you might use this data for. 29%. America had about 5% of the world's population at that point. Incredible overrepresentation in terms of the, the world. You now go to uh, 2010, and uh, America has 11% uh, of the, um, the world's uh, college enrollments. It's been this incredible spread of higher education. The country that's been most remarkable in spread in, in, in is China. Due to the uh, Cultural Revolution, uh, China basically had no students in 1970. I mean, the universities were closed, and the professors were being sent with dunce, not that I have like this, but dunce caps to the villages uh, where they were supposed to live like peasants, and the professors are not very good at that. Uh, 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 maybe somebody from Arkansas would know how to, how to do something, I don't know. But, uh, the Chinese professors did not do a good job there. We have 30 million people in China enrolled in universities in 2010. This last year, 6 million people graduated with bachelor's degrees. It's just an astounding number. That's more than people in a whole bunch of countries in the world. There's been a similar thing in, 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 in scientific papers. Um, and again, I hear just give you the, 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 all the numbers here are percentages. So the US in 1981 was 35.9% of the world's scientific papers were American. Again, we were 5% of the world's population. It's, it's a truly remarkable achievement in some sense. Um, it's down to 26.5% in 2009, um, which is a pretty big drop. But of course, what's going on is not that the Americans are not writing, doing science anymore. It's that other people around the world have joined in the scientific activity. And again, who's the biggest one in that? It, it, it's China. So China went from 0 0.3. 9.4. India actually went down in their scientific work, um, partially because India does a lot of their things in engineering. They don't write scientific papers. <coughs> it's not that they don't have. 
This is another aspect of, 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 this, of this new world, international collaboration. Um, so these are children for the world and for the U.S. Uh, Co-authorships going up. The, 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 the bottom line, the, the dots, that's not showing up as big as it should be. I'm sorry. My fault. Right, so to tell me this. So let me, uh, where, where do I get it? Up? The bottom here, I do it. Uh, uh, there we go. This one? Right, right, right. This one. Yes. Yeah, slideshow. I got it. Somebody should have told me this. Sorry. Um, I, I didn't know. Okay. So now you can see the international co authorships going on. There is more and more science is done not for people in one country, but with people in multiple countries. And it's a spread of knowledge. Now I want to show you the spread of knowledge in production. I'm going to show you the US and China. The US in 1997. This is, these are industries that are knowledge and technical intensive industries as determined by National Science Board in the United States, as they call it. So you see 35.5, it goes down to 31.8. You see all of these numbers getting smaller, but still the U.S. with 5% of the world's population is still a major, major player. And you see the, 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 the coming giant of, of, of China. So we have this uh, uh, spread of knowledge every place. Now we begin to ask, well, where do the immigrants and students fit into this? First, the fastest growing area of higher education is in inter international students. So here it's 1975, 600,000, 800,000, 2010, 4.1 million. That's faster than any, 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 uh, any growth rate in our country. I mean, in China, it's not as fast because they started at zero back in 1970. That's a, that's a, but this is just a, a huge growth in the uh, international students. Who are the immigrants who come to our country and work as scientists and engineers? This tells us that they are international students. The first column says foreign born chair. So 15%, 15.2% of the bachelor's graduates who do science and engineering are foreign born. Masters, 27.2%. Doctorates, 34.6%. And you go to faculty after faculty, and you just see four and more people all over the place. What, what, what kind of people are they? Were they educated in the U.S. or were they educated overseas? Um, the figures that say share of foreign board is the highest degree in the U.S. tells us the people who are educated in the U.S. And you see the bachelors. 54.3%. Not that many foreign, foreign people come to the country as bachelors, but uh, they're staying and, uh, and they're in science and engineering fields. The masters and the doctors, it's, it's over 60%. We get immigrants from the people who come as students in their classes. And of course, there is, is you, you would never know it, the debate in the Congress um, of whether we should encourage these students to stay. Well, somehow or other, they're staying in any case, because there they are as a, as a tremendous fraction of, of the, uh, the foreign-born people. We don't get that many people who are totally educated overseas coming to the U.S. to, to work. We get the people, we get the younger students working. This, this little uh, 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 statistic, how we can read them, this is a, a, a study we did looking at People who write a scientific paper in the U.S., meaning I wrote it and, and someone else in the, uh, the audience wrote it, and we're both in the U.S. writing our paper in the U.S. We said, how many names are Chinese? Oh, I mean, European, I know Saxon. I don't know if it's Chinese. We have, we have Vietnamese with all, all the names in the group. In 1985, it was 4.79%. In 2008, it was 14.16%. 14% of the people who write scientific papers in the U.S. are Chinese. And almost all of them are not American-born Chinese. They're, they're almost all of them are, are uh, born out, out, you know, outside, not most mainland, but they're Taiwanese people from Singapore and so on, but mostly they're mainland. So 
So inside the US, we have basically globalized and internationalized our production of scientific papers by having such a large fraction of the people that are working on this huge. This is now US and China collaborations where we say, we are here writing in the US, and we have a collaborator in Beijing or Shanghai or Wuhan or wherever. And uh, we, we saw already there was a big rise in the world's a share of uh, international co-working papers. The U.S. had a large increase. I want to focus on the thing that says U.S. share of countries' international collaborations. And what you see is that uh, the U.S. has become uh, the largest share, the huge share of China's international collaborations, 47.5%. Went up from 30, it was already big, 35.1%. Went up to 47.5%, disproportionately uh, write papers with Chinese. And now you look at the country's share of US international collaborations. And China in 1997, 3%, 3.2%, it's now 16%. China has surpassed the United Kingdom, Germany, Canada, France, Italy, Japan, uh, Australia. Etc. They are the biggest collaborator. So America is the biggest collaborator with China. China is the biggest collaborator with the U.S. And many of the Chinese people are writing papers in the U.S. That's internationalization, and it comes through international students and then people studying as 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 uh, if you're writing with somebody of a different, you know, outside here. So first we took the papers with only a U.S. address. That's everything's written here. And the variable that I'm going to focus on is the Chinese author proportion. So let's say a paper had me and two Chinese guys, uh, or had me and two from other groups or whatever it is. The positive coefficient means, yeah, we're getting such good Postdocs and graduate students and people come from China, that the papers look like they're better. They have a higher impact factor in, 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 in the journals they appear, and they gain more citations. Right. That is a huge uh, uh, thing for, the, for this international stuff. Then I took papers with one plus address, and uh, you have the same thing on the Chinese proportion, but you'll notice uh, one thing. It says here the reference group is only USA. That would be the people in columns one and two. If it's a US-China collaboration, it's a negative correlation. This tells us that not only are the Chinese contributing more to the US when they, when they, when they are here working, we get the great, kind of great best of the Chinese students, but that when, when someone in the US is working with someone in China, either the Chinese scientific environment is not as good as ours, or they're working with someone who maybe couldn't get to, to a U.S. graduate school, and there's a lot lower. We don't know whether it's the quality of the, of the author. So, and, 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 and so you see that this international Congress and getting the people into our country is, is what is what greatly benefits and runs this uh, our scientific um, activity at this point. So. That's just the, the fact is our whole science thing lives on having international folks. I think China because they're the biggest, but they're not they're not the majority of, of international students. It's just there's a big country that that they're the good one to, 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 to look at. Okay. Thank you, Professor Green. Our next featured speaker is Professor Christopher Heath Wellman. Wellman is Chair of the Department of Philosophy at Washington University, St. Louis. His research focuses on ethics, applied ethics, and legal and political philosophy. He has published extensively on issues in ethics and political theory, including international law, political authority, secession, and immigration. His presentation tonight is titled, The Right to Exclude. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, 
So there are three questions here on the symposium of immigration. Who gets in, on what terms, who gets to decide? I want to take a shot at the third question, who gets to decide? Uh, and my answer uh, that I propose is legitimate states. I think legitimate states uh, may control uh, their borders, they can adopt exclusionary policies, uh, and in fact, they, if they want to, they can exclude all outside, including uh, uh, refugees who desperately need to seek asylum. Before I argue for that, I want to make a couple things clear. Uh, I don't mean to defend the desirability or even the permissibility of the status quo. I think that what we have in the world today is an utter moral abomination. I also uh, want to emphasize that although I'm going to talk about a state's right to decide whether or not they want to exclude outside, I'm not an advocate for more exclusionary policies. If I was czar, I would like the borders, my borders would be much more porous. I think that would be better for individual states and also better for the world as a whole. And my own personal background is that my parents are from different countries, uh, so I would not be here uh, to be making any kind of law for my for migration that was permitted by uh, states. Okay, so why do I think that legitimate states get to decide? <clears throat> Three core premises. One is I believe that legitimate states are entitled to political self-determination. Two, I think that freedom of association is a core component of self-determination. And three, uh, I think that freedom of association necessarily includes the right to exclude. So if you put all those three together, uh, I think that you can come up with a weighty but presumptive, not necessarily absolute, right uh, to exclude. To motivate the case, let me very quickly talk about it in a domestic realm. So imagine that um, my father said, uh, was allowed to choose an unmarriageable partner. Uh, some people know my father, you know that he's much brighter than I, he might be able to choose much better than I and I should probably delegate to him in a number of spheres. Uh, maybe so. But it's clear that if he is entitled to choose my marital partner rather than I, that there's an important sense in which I lack self-determination. Right? There's a, a very important sense in which I'm not the author of my own life. Even if my life might go better if he were choosing the next year. Right? So the idea is you think that if you're um, you know, a competent adult, you're entitled to self-determination. And part of that is freedom of association. Right? So you get to uh, get married if you want. Uh, but crucially, uh, someone can't marry you against your will. No one else gets to choose um, for you. You get to choose from yourself. And you can reject prospective suitors, things like this. Okay? I think that legitimate states uh, are analogous to this. Okay? So I believe that legitimate states are entitled to political self-determination and that freedom of association is a component of that. To motivate that, think about a uh, legitimate state. I think a paradigmatic um, candidate would be something like Norway. All right? Imagine that the European Union wanted to wanted Norway to join. And they said, We've got a great thing going here, the EU is fantastic, All right? And they invite Norway. Oh, this is thanks, but no thanks. Uh, as they have, in fact, now, they've had a couple of Do you think it would be okay for the EU to say, well, we're going to force the annex of Sweden? But what about Sweden, right? Norway seceded from Sweden in 1905. Uh, Sweden's living pretty large. They're doing pretty well. They're going, you know, we're better when we were joined in Norway, especially now they got all the money from the North Sea oil. Let's see if they want to get back together. So Sweden might say, we've tried it apart. Let's get back together. Uh, Norway says, thanks, but no thanks. We'd like to uh, maintain our sovereignty. Do you think Sweden would be permitted to forcefully annex Norway? I don't. I think that it's up to the Norwegians to decide whether they'd like to be uh, part of the EU or not. And I think that it's up to the Norwegians to decide whether they'd like to uh, merge again with Sweden. And I think that Norwegians are entitled to make that call because it's part of self-determination uh, to which they're entitled as a legitimate state. And the important thing to see here, right, is that Norwegian, Norwegians get to reject a prospective association with the EU or with Sweden. Very same reason 
I think, if there was a particular European or a particular Sweden who said, you know what, life is good in Sweden, but I'd like to come live in Norway. Right? I'd like to join your political community. I think that just as I uh, would be entitled to reject a prospective suitor, Norway as a whole has a choice whether or not to let prospective new members join their political community. Right? And so I think just as Norway can say to Sweden as a whole, no, we prefer not to uh, join a new country. Norway can say to an individual Swede, uh, no, we prefer not to reach you into our political community. So that's the, the basic line that I use to defend a presumptive right uh, to exclude outsiders. But importantly, it's only presumptive, and it might be outweighed. Uh, and it's very tempting to think that it's outweighed because of the profound uh, inequities that we see globally, right? So you could think of um, uh, people in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, who, through no fault of them, their own, are unable to meet their basic needs. Right? There are millions of people who, no matter how hard they work, what they do, they cannot ensure that their children get sufficient caloric intake every day. Right? These people might desperately want to get into Norway where uh, they um, could take advantage of enormous economic opportunities. Cases extreme as this, we want to say, distributive justice, global distributive justice trumps the presumptive right of self-determination. And it would be to fetishize self-determination to think that the Norwegians would have a right to exclude these sub-Saharan Africans. I think that's tempting, uh, but it's, it's wrong. It's a little more complicated than that. I certainly think that the Norwegians may not just turn their back on people who are starving them. Okay? I agree with that. I also think that they're very demanding and stringent duties of distributive justice that the world's uh, fabulously after them, like the Norwegians, have to the desperately poor. But it's not clear to me that those duties have to be discharged in the currency of open borders. I think the Norwegians can decide. It is their call. They get to decide. So they might say, OK, let's let in uh, some of these people who are struggling. So for instance, uh, Oslo has a non-negligible Pakistani community, uh, which the Norwegians uh, have allowed uh, to come. And, uh, but the Norwegians might say, no, you know, we, we really value our community as it stands. And so we want to we protect our political community. If so, right, then it seems to me they need to help these people in sub-Saharan Africa where they are. They can export aid rather than open borders. And as long as they do their fair share, and take the reason where people can disagree about precisely what uh, Norwegians and others are required to do, but as long as they discharge their duties of global distributive justice by helping Norwegians where they are, right, uh, then they're entitled to keep uh, their doors closed and they can exclude these people. Okay? Uh, so, uh, again, I think there's a, a duty, but it's disjunctive. Either they have to open their doors, or if they're unwilling to open their doors, they need to help these people where they are. A possible exception, though, would be refugees, right? Because these are people, uh, especially if they're being persecuted by their home state, you can't just send them refuge in a box. You can, you can send welfare cheese, you can send all kinds of things, you can send teams of people. Uh, but uh, take, for instance, the uh, Kurds in northern Iraq. If they're being persecuted by Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist regime, uh, it seems like then we have a counterexample. Then the Norwegians have no choice but to open the door. Also tempting, but I think that's too quick as well. I think that, again, you have a disjunctive duty. Clearly, I think, this is kind of much, but clearly I think the Norwegians have to do something to help uh, these uh, refugees like the Kurds in northern Iraq. Uh, but there are multiple options. One way you can do it is open your doors and say, you're welcome to take refuge here. But you're also entitled to go and help them where they are. Right? And this was done, 
for instance, in terms of setting up a safe haven in North America for the uh, internationally enforced no-fly zone. That's another way to get revenue. So these people need refuge. I think arguably have a right to refuge, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily have a right to refuge in Norway. Uh, so even in the case of, uh, of uh, people seeking asylum, it, it doesn't automatically follow that um, the legitimate state doesn't get a right um, to uh, decide. And just one last thing I want to point out, you might smell an inconsistency here. It's like, whoa, kid, you're you know, going on and on about Norway having the right to political self-determination so they get decided. But isn't Norway violating the rocks? Um, right to self-determination, if they go in uh, and start taking over uh, the processes they put there? Uh, and the answer is close to yes. It's not that they're violating a lot's right to self-determination, because I think Rock does a lot under some of the things that this regime would not have the right. My view is not that all states have the right to self-determination. My right is that all, my argument is that all legitimate states have the right to self-determination. And if you are the type of state that is creating refugee problems by uh, persecuting or at least not protecting your citizens, then you're not performing the requisite political functions, you're not performing.